Awesome. Hello, everyone. Great to have everyone back to the city seminar this uh, sem semester. And today we are great to have uh, Xunghua, an expert of Galaxy Formation, to give us a seminar today. Xunghua was a CETA National Fellow at UBC for two years before he recently joined us as CETA as a CETA Postdoctoral Fellow. Uh, at UBC, he worked with Professor Douglas Scott and Luda van Verbicki studying star formation in proto galaxy at high redshift using both simulation and observational data. He got his PhD from Amherst uh, University of Massachusetts in 2019, uh, working with Professor Ho Jun Ho on galaxy formation and evolution. And he received his master in Seoul National University working on halo mass function. His general research interests also include theoretical and observational cosmology. So today, Sun Huang will talk about constraint on galaxy formation from the cosmic infrared background optical cross correlation. So take, take it away, Sun Huang. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, thank you. Um, thank you for welcoming me by giving an opportunity to take one of these um, seminars last. Uh, so my name is Sun Huang. Um, I'm a new postdoc fellow at CEDA, um, but like just Jennifer introduced, um, I've been a CEDA National Fellow at, at uh, UBC for two years, so maybe not completely new uh, from employment perspective. Um, so at UBC, I've been working with um, Douglas Riley, um, Ludo, um, but for this, particular, uh, for this particular project that I'll be talking about today, um, I also work with a couple of guys at CEA as well, including um, Zhang Shao, Erve, um, and Mark Hong Chuan, uh, who is a former CEDA Zen. I think Ludo was also a uh, former CEDA and once upon a time. Um, and, and I'm also a member of a Euclid Consortium and, and CFIS unions. And I guess I also have to probably belong to KISS collaboration at a certain point before the end of this project, um, since I'm using proprietary data of, um, C, uh, of KISS um, through Ludo, uh, but not yet, um, I don't belong yet um, since I, I have too many KISS myself already at home, so I don't want to add more KISS too soon. Um, and in the past, I also worked with uh, um, Professor Jim Mo and his groups, uh, who was my uh, PhD thesis advisor at UMass. And then I was also worked on a small project, uh, mainly working with uh, Mark Vogelsberger and his colleagues within the uh, Illust TNG um, group um, before the data went public. Um, so, yeah. Um, but then, you know, maybe before going into this particular study, um, I think it might be helpful to introduce a little bit on my past works and a little bit more general research interests. So this was the exact first slide of my PhD defense from two years ago. Um, so during my PhD, um, I constructed a group catalog um, by applying a halo-based group finder, uh, which I developed and improved um, to galaxies from observation surveys. Um, and so, and then um, I, I used this catalog to cross correlate um, to study um, the connection between galaxy properties and dark matter halo properties um, in various aspects and in comprehensive ways. So one particular application of, of that was um, a Srinivas Zeldovich effect. So uh, I investigate the SZ effect signal uh, from halos of different properties um, by cross correlating this group catalog uh, with, the, for instance, the Planck map. Um, and the key findings were that um, we detect all variants as expected by the cosmic baryon fraction. So there is no missing baryon. And also that the thermal energy of the hot gas um, in halos inferred from a thermal SZ effect is not proportionally scaling with the halo mass. So in other words, um, it's, uh, it's not self-similar. Uh, so the main base pitch of my research has been that uh, we need to study environment um, to understand galaxy formation. So there is this uh, famous Korean movie about an expert of guessing or telling people's destiny by looking at their face, looking at their face, believe it or not. And the, at the end of the movie, the expert says that um, although it's the winds that create the waves, um, I only saw the waves um, fail to see the winds. So that's an expression of regret that um, he was missing what's more important um, in understanding people's destiny. And similarly, I would argue that um, we have to study the largest scale structures and environments um, in order to uh, properly understand galaxy formation. Um, since galaxies form and evolve in 
that Khmer hair loose, which in turn grew through mass accretion flow um, along the cosmic web. So if you think about that, actually that's pretty uh, straightforward intuitively. I mean, so these are actually not galaxies and filaments, but this is actually a map of the city light focused on France or Europe. And that is superimposed on the maps of the roadways. So the thin lines are showing the roadways. And you can see that, you know, at almost every knot of the roadways, you know, there is a, a blob of light, which implies uh, big cities and population. So I think this analogy implies a lot of interesting possibilities about the connection between um, galaxies and cosmic web. You know, for instance, you know, people move along the roadways and, and where the roadways intersect each other, there are cities that form. And by the way, one striking fact about this map is that the thin lines are actually not the current roadways, not the modern day roadways, but the roadways built uh, by Roman Empire 2000 years ago. So such a strong correlation between uh, the lines and the blobs um, says that the people barely built new cities. Uh, since the Roman times. And I think that's also analogous to the gas formation. You know, most of those massive galaxies uh, stopped, you know, uh, forming or stopped, you know, uh, star formation um, since a long time ago. Um, and then, yeah, so here are those group catalogs that we constructed. So we first used the 2MLS, um, uh, which is 2 mass rash to survey. So 2 mass, since I was a UMass, you know, 2 mass is a a largely UMass driven survey, um, as you can guess from its name. Um, so we used two MRS to construct the uh, old sky group catalog. And then we also added um, 6DF and SDSS and then 2DF um, to go a little deeper into um, some particular um, directions of the sky whenever the additional data are available. So to my knowledge, um, this is still one of the largest um, old sky uh, galaxy group catalog. And then, um, yeah, like I said, I'm also a member of uh, Euclid's uh, collaboration. Um, and, and I wonder who are these ignorant people, you know, a uh, large gathering without physical distancing, with no mask. Uh, so this was just two years ago um, when I attended my first Euclid meeting and, and last Euclid meeting in person. So hopefully things change this year. And then uh, finally at UBC, um, I turned my focus on to a little bit higher redshift, like the cosmic noon and before, um, so more direct studying um, galaxy formation, um, exactly when they were forming. Um, so working with Douglas Wiley, Arif, and, and Scott, Scott Chapman, um, we found that the uh, star formation rate um, predicted by the current simulations uh, for the product clusters about an order of magnitude lower than the observed uh, uh, product clusters. But actually what I learned more from this um, study uh, was that um, it is so subtle and so tricky uh, to do a fair comparison between the observed and, and simulated product clusters. I mean, beginning from how to define them, you know, how do we define product clusters? The answer to that question is totally different between simulation observation and also the boundary or aperture of the uh, product clusters and, and how to select member galaxies within that aperture and, and also conversion from some millimeter flux to star formation rate or conversion from, uh, for instance, CO transition line intensity uh, to gas mass estimate. So there are a lot of uncertainties included in this kind of comparison. So uh, we paid extra, extra amount of uh, attention uh, to those uncertainties so basically the half of the whole paper is all about uh, deep discussions and careful treatments about uh, for a comparison to be fair. Okay, so I think maybe that's long enough introduction. So let me get into what I'm currently working on right now. Um, so I will dissect each part of uh, uh, this project title for you to demonstrate uh, why this is an inevitable thing to study and why this phrase uh, is the minimum for that. So let me first begin with the, uh, why is the CIB an optical? So CIB or cosmic infrared background um, is the relic of UV or optical starlight um, observed by dust and we read it in the infrared or some millimeter flux band. So as you can see in um, this plot on the left, for instance, you know, actually the CIB contains more original starlight uh, than the rest of the unobserved starlight in the UV band. So that's that, you know, um, 
the CIB contains a large amount of information about the star formation history of the universe, particularly when galaxies are most, uh, most actively forming stars. So it is crucial to study the CIB uh, for understanding galaxy formation. But at the same time, also um, the rest of the starlight that is not observed by dust uh, still exists to be observe, observed in the uh, optical band. Um, so both the CIB and the optical band um, contain a piece of information uh, regarding the uh, star, uh, gas formation each. And then, then why do we use the uh, whole images um, instead of catalog or, or identified sources? So, so many people have their mind so focused on to catalogs and do only um, source-based analysis. But what about the leftover? I mean, the rest of the image of a giant piece of sky that may contain extra information. So why do we, why do we just throw that away? So I have three very young kids who are extremely picky eaters. And um, whenever we order uh, this jade the pops, so this is, um, Korean dish of spiced pork over rice, um, one of my favorites. This is actually the real data of a joke about that I had at Galleria supermarket just a few days ago. And so whenever we order this um, joke about, um, my kids eat up all the meat. So my wife and I are only left with the vegetables and my wife and I are a vegetarian for, for your information. So this is what I had, um, what we had, for instance, um, so a master jerk with a lot of masking and they have uh, such a good meat detection limit. So they don't do many mistakes. And they, they even had a fried chicken before that, uh, for God's sake. Um, and we cannot order another jerk pop since first of all, you know, kids will come back and eat up the meat again. So, so the results will be the same. And secondly, we cannot afford it. I mean, when you have three kids, you know, um, you already paid a lot for the first round of ordering foods, so you cannot go uh, for the second round. And instead, I never hesitate to take just the leftover, um, since otherwise I'm starving, um, like, like sushi without fish or hot dog without sausage. Those are my regular meals. And that's actually, actually what I'm doing here. Um, so the meat is a source or catalog of the uh, identified sources the most tempting part in a glimpse. But after raising three kids for six years, you know, I am more used to the rest of the maps. So this project is such a parent study, I would say. So this is the one of the maps that I'm using for analysis. So you can see there are so many holes um, after masking each and every identified source. So do you see any fluctuation or any signal in the left turbo? If you don't, then that's because uh, you don't have young kids, so you don't do much sacrifice on a daily basis. Uh, but by the end of this talk, you know, you will be convinced that um, there are a lot of signals um, coming from that area. So, but, you know, I'm not just taking it just because it's given to me. Um, instead, I understand its value, like healthy nutrition in vegetables of Jericopa. So, um, Inevitably, you know, catalog or identified sources only contain a very limited fraction of the total emission. So mostly only less than 30% of the total um, CIV emission are found in those um, individually detected sources. And that's about less than 5% in terms of the number count. While the signals from the cosmic noon and higher redshift are all buried in those um, unresolved uh, backgrounds. So that's the emission that we have to chase for if you want to uh, study uh, gas formation. Um, then finally, um, why do we choose the cross correlation um, as the method for our analysis? So many optical telescopes, um, particularly those that are ground based, they suffer a lot from a lot of different um, noise sources from the Earth's, uh, Earth's atmosphere to uh, bright stars and, and instrumental artifacts. And so does the CFIS. So the CFIS is one of our data we are using. Um, so the image on the right here, um, this one, um, is actually the CFIS map of one of our fields, which is the EGS field. And you see, you know, all different kinds of contamination in the image, right? Um, first of all, you see a lot of um, bright outer residual halos or bright stars, um, even though we already quite aggressively masked those uh, the, uh, inner part of the stars. 
And then at the bottom, bottom right corner of this image, you know, you also see um, these um, instrumental artifacts, which is um, a reflection of the primary mirror on the poker plate. And also you see these are uh, lines or rectangles of uh, uh, these continuities, uh, which are darker, which look darker than the neighboring area. So that's uh, due to the modulation of the background from the data or from the data processing. So if you do an autocorrelation of this kind of image, then all these uh, contamination will affect your measurement and significantly affecting also your interpretation of your results. Of course, you know, for some of the current or upcoming surveys like Euclid, you know, the map will be much cleaner and uh, the situation will be better. But even for this kind of highly contaminated image, um, if you do cross correlation uh, with the totally different survey, for instance, fire, which is shown on the left, then since you do not expect the same noise at the same position in the other survey, so if, so if you do the cross correlation, uh, then the the cross correlation uh, it will erase the, the noise, um, impact of the noise or uh, the, the contamination uh, to your measurements. So uh, as for the data, um, like I already said briefly, um, I, we are using the Herschel Spire map um, to trace the dust emission and some millimeter emission. Um, so the beam size of the spire are between um, 18 and 36 arc second. And the image on the right here um, shows uh, what the most contiguous spire map, um, um, which is actually a combination of uh, three individual um, neighboring fields at the equator. Um, and then you see a um, couple of large filamentary structure, bright structure, which is the galactic cirrus in the image. So we do have uh, too much fruitful data here. So we need a little bit of help um, to sort out the data. I mean, literally, so there is this project uh, named HELP, so Herschel Extra Galactic Legacy Project, uh, which sold out the Herschel data to provide the um, um, best product, in a sense, uh, for a total of 23 uh, primary Herschel fields. So we use this data. And then also, like I said already, um, another data we, we are using the, uh, is the CFIS R band images. So the CFIS is the uh, Canada France um, imaging survey. Um, so appropriate data to use um, for a researcher in Canada. So the CFIS um, it will eventually observe a total of 5,000 square degree of the uh, northern sky. Um, but then after multiple delays, um, as usual, you know, it's currently about 60% done and it will continue through um, 2025. So the, in the image on the right, uh, the, the red solid line shows the survey boundary um, of the CFIS R band. And, and this shows that uh, this figure shows the current, um, uh, current data, data availability. Uh, so the CFIS is also part of a larger collaboration called the unions. Um, so under these unions, um, there are these CFIS and like pastors, uh, Subaru HSC, and uh, the recently joined the research team from Japan. So with the CFIS covering UNR band and then PASTAS covering GNZ band and, and HSC covering, um, sorry, PASTAS covering INZ band and HSC covering GNZ band. Uh, one of the main goals of this union's collaboration is to uh, provide a ground-based support and, and complementary um, observations for the Euclid mission. And that said, you know, we will eventually apply our study and methodology to the, the, to the Euclid data. So here, uh, the red solid line shows the survey boundary of the Euclid survey, which is basically the whole, the whole sky, um, except the galactic plane and the Euclid plane. And the patches of different colors are showing, you know, when each part of the sky uh, will be observed uh, with the Euclid. And the cyan line um, in the northern sky shows the survey boundary of the unions and uh, uh, the same cyan line, but in the southern sky um, shows the survey boundary for uh, DES um, instead of unions. Yeah, so um, from the CFIS and SPIRE maps, we identify and choose uh, five major fields that overlap between the two data, two surveys. Um, so the total combined sky area is about 90 square degree. And these, they are these 
five fields. So um, um, inside the uh, red rectangles, I mean. So on the left, there are these four fields, uh, which is uh, FLS, EGS, uh, LSN1, and LSN2. And then on the right, uh, there is this uh, another uh, large big chunk of sky near the galaxy pole, uh, which is the HLS and P field. So we cross correlate um, between the spire and surface mass for these uh, five fields, five, five uh, areas. Then uh, here are the images of those five fields from each survey. So the spire maps are on the left and the surface maps are on the right. Um, so in the spire maps, you know, each of these little squares um, is the individual single um, surface tile uh, with the full visit of three times over the same sky area. Um, so from these um, surface tiles, we construct uh, this uh, large, uh, big uh, mosaic map of the surface uh, which are shown on the right. So in this image, uh, each of these uh, black little dots is a masking we apply uh, for bright stars mostly, um, but also there are a much smaller mask and or irregular shaped mask um, um, that is mainly for galaxies. So like I said earlier, you know, um, even after uh, this much aggressive mass, automated masking already, um, there are still a lot of stars, bright stars, whose outer part extends to the large radii to dominate the map in both amplitude and sky area. Um, so we further uh, manually check the map and mask those bright residues. Um, and in fact, we find that you know, if we do not mask those bright residues carefully, then and all we get is just fake signal or, or statistical noise, since they are much brighter than, than our signals. Um, and then yet another big decision we had to make was um, whether we want to use the low surface brightness or LSP data um, uh, for the surface or, or to use the uh, non-LSP maps. So CFIS comes in these two different flavors um, in its data processing pipeline and, and the map product um, and very roughly describing the LSP maps, keep all the moves as they are um, because they are mostly for the sciences such as uh, tidal feature or, or Milky Way ISM uh, for which the fainter, uh, bright, uh, fainter outer part of the objects matter. But then the disadvantage of this LSP production is that uh, we have to block all these uh, contaminated areas uh, to look for our signals. So we are left with a much smaller area um, to do analysis with. On the other end, uh, the non-LSP processing that erases um, all large scale fluctuations by estimating and subtract the uh, local background on every arc mini scale. So after that processing, you know, the map looks much cleaner. Um, but the problem of the non sp processing is that the, it erases, you know, any mode just on the scales larger than our community, you know, whether it is uh, uh, artifacts or stars or uh, Milky Way contamination, but also potentially our extragalactic signal. So that's that's the problem. So um, here is another example which shows a whole single surface tile as the tile. Um, being totally unusable due to this uh, one single bright star or artifact um, at the bottom right corner of the tile. But after the non uh data processing, you know, map looks much cleaner, it's cleaned up a lot, uh, but it's cleaned up a lot together with the potentially our uh, extragative signals also removed. So that, so for that reason, uh, we do not uh, use the non -SP, um uh, instead, we use the we choose the LSP data uh, for the our analysis, and this is another example with the same storyline. Um, so, but here instead of those uh, pointy sources, you also see this a uh, little bit larger scale filamentary structure um, near the center of the image. Um, to me, it's likely to be the galactic series instead of um, extra galactic signal. Uh, but even if you know, no matter what that was, I mean, even if it was um, our extra galactic signal that is completely removed um, by the non sp data processing, as you can see on the right. So um, here, um, this shows um, how one of our fields, which is FLS uh, field, uh, looks um, with the LSP data processing in the upper panel and, and with the non sp data processing in the lower panel. So you see you know, this um, large filamentary structure of galactic series once again, uh, which is nicely represented in the LSP map. 
But then after the neural split processing, you know, in the low panel, that feature um, together with the many other large scale structures are completely gone. Then um, regarding, you know, uh, quantitative methodology, we uh, do, uh, we calculate the cross power spectra uh, between Spire and CFIS maps. So, well, so here is a little bit of math. Um, since I'm now in a, one of the few sanctuary institutions for theory and theorists, since in, in most other places, they are like, you know, do not include an equation um, since in your slides, since nobody will understand it. But, but how do you understand things without equation? That's the, that's the language of the nature. Um, so, but actually this is a very basic, you know, general computation of the cross power spectra. And the equation at the bottom here, um, this one is actually showing that the, our, the, the map product, map product that we are using um, is made, was made by convolving, first convolving the intrinsic sky signal, which is I sky, with the beam size, instrument to beam, which is denoted by B. And then there is also um, instrument to noise added, which is denoted by N. And then here um, next, the T uh, stands for the transfer function. Uh, so transfer function uh, measures or represents, uh, for instance, a scale dependent filtering um, that occurs during the map making process. And then finally, there's the masking, um, which is a multiplication in the real space and thus a convolution in, uh, in the free space. So based on this uh, schematic equation, uh, we recover uh, the true underlying power spectra from the directly measured cross power spectra uh, following this set of equations. Uh, so I will, I will not go into the details of this equation unless you know, there's a question um, asked about that. Uh, but then um, here I'm showing the transfer function, how the transfer function for the spire map um, look for the uh, a couple of different fields. So we take the average transfer function um, from the different fields and use that, uh, insert that into this equation to uh, recover the true uh, spectra. Okay, so um, the detection of um, uh, cross correlation signal obtained with those equations is very strong. So here the black symbols are showing the total net power spectra um, between the spy and CFIS maps. And, but here we take an extra step, um, which are shown by the blue and uh, red symbols. So while the black symbols show the net power spectra, uh, we also separately calculate the cross power that comes from in-phase and, and out-of-phase um, component. Um, and how we do that is that uh, we first calculate the um, phase angle difference uh, between the two transform, two free transforms, which is one for uh, spire map and the other for uh, surface map. So we calculate the phase difference uh, for each pixel of uh, the two maps. And then we separately compute the power, cross power that comes from the pixels with the phase difference uh, less than 90 degrees, so pi over two and greater than pi over two. And the former is sort of um, in phase um, cross power component, which I show by the blue. And the latter is sort of out of phase component, which I show by the red. Um, so in a sense, the blue measures a, a positive correlation and the red measures a, a negative correlation uh, and the black is the net of the two. So in case of no, no net correlation at all, then blue is expected to be the same as red. And if the blue is higher than the red, then that means there is a, a net positive correlation. And if the red is higher than the blue, then that means there is a net anti-correlation. Uh, so that's, that's how to uh, interpret the, uh, this blue, red, and, and black thing. Uh, but then another um, separation we make for the data is that, um, so um, for one set of measurements, we use the, the original CFIS maps uh, where only the stars and artifacts are masked. So that is shown in the upper panel. And for the other set of measurements, we use the CFIS maps where not only just get, uh, stars and artifacts, but also every identified galaxy is also a masked. So that map is shown in the lower panel. And the, the cross correlation signal that I showed in the previous slide was based on the upper panel. And then um, do we also detect a, a strong cross correlation signal 
um, from the lower panel. So is there any signal coming from the complete background? And if yes, then, then how much is in there? So um, here are the answers. Um, so even from the background only map or galaxy master map, um, we detect a quite a strong correlation signal. So like I said, like I, you know, according to the interpretation of the blue and red thing, you know, uh, the, you see the blue uh, is higher than the red, um, which means there is net positive correlation. And also here, we also plot the dotted line, uh, which uh, represents the uh, empirically estimate the noise level um, in case of no correlation. So we obtain the dotted line by uh, randomizing the phase of the Fourier transforms. So the fact that the blue, sorry, the black, which is the net power spectra, is higher than the uh, dotted line, the noise level, um, says that, that there is a signal in excess of uh, uh, statistical noise. So we find a strong, quite a strong correlation signal in, in all three um, spire bands. I'm sorry, Miss. Sorry. Uh, like, yeah. like, like, you know, what do the like, what do the blue and red mean again? Sorry, like you mentioned before, but I missed it. I think. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So I mean, you know, during our project of uh, over a year, you know, we've been al always, you know, um, whenever we have a new meeting, we always confirm what's the, what was the meaning of the blue and red. Um, so blue is kind of measures um positive correlation um only um and then red kind of measures um negative correlation only um between the two maps and then and then black is kind of um the total sum so blue plus red actually blue minus red um in, in schema um schematically but um yeah so is that is that enough for it um, i don't understand what that means uh like like like, does the blue mean that you're only taking like the positive? Like, I mean, like, 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 does it mean that? I mean, like, does it mean that okay. you're only correlating with like parts of the map or something? I mean, uh, oh yeah, yeah. So, so we do this on on the free free space. So, um, we tra free transform um both of the CFIS and the uh, uh, spire map, and then. You know, for each pixel of those free trans free uh free space map, um, we do have um phase uh angle information of each free transform, right? Uh, but then uh we uh, based on the phase angle difference, so difference in the phase angle uh, between the uh, CFIS and the spire uh, map for each pixel, uh, we only selected for the blue, we only select the pixels with um phase phase difference rate uh, less than uh, 90 degrees less than pi over two um, and then for the red um, red is the rest of that so uh, the the pixel uh, power from the pixels are uh, with the phase difference uh, greater than uh, pi over two so that's how we calculate that and so why do you do this separation of these right nerd? yeah so um so historically um we so, so I will talk later about the galactic um, con uh, contamination, we create contamination. So the, the initial idea or the initial motivation was, uh, uh, you know, uh, we were suspecting that uh, some of this signal might be affected by um, um, the contamination by the Milky Way. Um, and at the time, and still we are not completely sure whether, um, so how, you know, that galactic component will um, come in those, uh, these measurements and, and, and earlier, you know, once there was a, once a, a point at which we thought that um, um, we are using the um, uh, maps that galactic component only appears as an absorption. So we were expecting that um, that would appear as a negative correlation. Um, so it appears as a blue, uh, sorry, appears as the red. Uh, but then, you know, later the story got um, complicated and, and now we are using um, this blue and red separation um, just to ensure that um, since, you know, we are taking for the y-axis value here, we are taking just absolute value, right, uh, or amplitude. So um, even if there is um, no signal, but um, totally just that is called noise, you know, that noise also will appear as a, something like, you know, something like black, I mean, some positive number. Um, so um, to ensure um, that we are um, detecting signal in excess of noise, uh, we did uh, two different things. One is blue and red separation, and the other is uh, the dotted line um, to see whether the net uh, power spectra is uh, located above the dotted line. So yeah, so there's been a little bit of history of um, separation of blue and red, um, and now is um, we are using that um, with a different purpose than the original purpose, initial purpose, but um, 
yeah but still still we just continue to use that um so maybe that's that's the reason why um it's confusing <laughs> it's confusing uh, to others could, could i jump into this for a second um, yeah yeah i'm a bit surprised as well um why wouldn't you do cosine and sine uh, because in that case what you would get is a small sine component and the issue is uh, if there's, you know, galactic contamination that's still in there or something, would you tend to get a signal like that in sign? But if you were dealing with a pure sky, you wouldn't get a sign term. Um, yeah, I mean, so this is, this was um, one of many attempts that we tried. Um, we just um, so yeah, we also you know um, considered you know um, use treating um, uh, taking. Uh, uh, real part and imaginary part and then different you know angle defined in different spaces and then so on um, but we just we just um so this is just you know one of the choices that we we just made um um yeah so so yeah so there is no clear answer so there was no clear reason that uh, we just um we just specifically chose this um uh, made this choice uh, instead of other um possible um um possible ways to do the same thing Right. Um, um, then we also perform the null test um, to ensure that our method is not um, biased, and our interpretation about the uh, and prediction about the behavior of the blue, red, and, and black thing um, and dotted line thing makes sense. So here, as you can see, um, the results from the null test um, show that the blue is almost same as the red, and and the black is um, on the top of the uh, dotted line, the noise level. So which is all um, as we expected. So um, now we are confident that um, we um, detect um, a real physical signal um, instead of a statistical noise. And also our method or interpretation um, is, not, um, is not biased in our measurements or, or results. Uh, but then, you know, um, very long um, story of our pursuit um, has just began, um, which is all about the Milky Way contamination um, in our signal. So unfortunately, the Milky Way component also appears as a positive correlation, as you can see in these images. So um, the upper panel shows the spire map and the lower panel shows the uh, surface map of the same field, which is FLS. And you see, you know, this um, large, you know, big galactic filament appearing um, both in spire and surface maps. So, I mean, so even if it's not the entire detection, but, but there could be still partial contribution or contamination from the Milky Way component in, the, in our signal. So how do we account for that? How do we, how do we subtract that component from, from our measurements? Um, so, well, there's still ongoing very active discussions internally within our group on this issue. So that is why we recently um, invited Mark Antoine to this project, um, who is an expert in separating galactic dust from um, extra galactic dust emission. Um, but but we so um, I don't have yet I don't know yet um, his advice on this issue since we are at the beginning of very busy semester, so we haven't had um, yet time to sit and talk all together. But right now, you know, um, for now we've been using. Galactic maps from other surveys. So one example um, is a dust map of by Schlegel et al., which is shown on the left. And another example can be FS Berg uh, bone atrium column density map, which is shown on the right. So using these, sorry, using these um, two, um, using these galactic maps, we do a pixel to pixel regression, nonlinear regression between one of these galactic maps and and either spire or or, or a surface map, and estimate the subtract. The estimate and subtract the uh, resulting um, average regression um, from the spire map or surface map to get a Milky Way free or galaxy free uh, map, um, assuming that the, the, the regression is tracing the Milky Way component. So, but then the question is, you know, how do we know that a method works well or not? So, how do we check the map, the result of the method, performance of the method? So. Well, so there's still, we need also uh, some more uh, conversation on, on this issue. Um, 
But then um, right now in my mind, you know, one way to do this is that um, since, you know, if the method works perfectly well, then we do have uh, one, we do have a MQA only map in one hand and the, the MQA free map in the other hand. And if the method, you know, perfectly separate the two components, then, then if we do the cross correlation between the two maps, and then that should be zero, right? So that's what I check and, and show uh, in this left panel. Well, there are, you know, there are a little bit of, um, you know, um, sign of blue being higher than the red for the first few beans on large scales, uh, which means there is a net positive collision, um, maybe due to, you know, uh, residual um, galaxy component, which was not subtracted perfectly by the method. But at least for the um, intermediate scale and then small scales, you know, uh, the blue is becoming much closer to the red, uh, meaning there's no net uh, correlation and, and there's no residual uh, MQA um, component. But we are not entirely sure about um, this test yet. So uh, hopefully Mark Antoine can show us a way to uh, be more sure uh, on this issue. But then the next question that we had was, um, you know, if, uh, if the signal is that much strong as we found, find from our measurements, are we supposed to see it by eyes uh, directly from the maps? And, and the answer was definitely yes. So, um, well, there's some discussions for the, for the background only map, uh, but at least for the galaxy map, for the original maps, uh, it's so clear that we can easily identify a um, relatively large area of like 10 arc minute across um, that contain multiple sources at the exact same location in both spire and surface maps. So one example of such is shown on the uh, left here, which is part of the EGS field. So you can see there is this uh, N-shaped um, um, alignment of uh, arrangement of galaxies um, in near the center of the image um, at almost same positions. And also another example is shown on the right here, uh, which is part of the uh, LSN one field. So not only the uh, circular pointy sources, there is this uh, little weird shaped U or V shaped or hot shaped uh, um, blob of dark area um, just to the left from the uh, center of the image. So that could be um, um, you know, a couple of galaxies aligned along the line of sight. So that has a very similar shape and then at the almost same position in both maps. And this is also another story, um, but for the background only map. So I will do this part real quick. Um, so um, since you know the 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 the, the lower half of the uh, surface image is highly contaminated, so so we do not look at those areas. So I I will just block. And then also there are uh, bright residual outer halos of stars. So we also block. Uh, for instance, here. Uh, so we also block those area. And then we. You, you identify you know, a couple of uh, correlated areas that look darker than, than the, the other areas in, in safe, at the same position in both maps, for instance, here, and, and another dark area um, here, another uh, little dark area here, another example here. And then you also see a couple of you know, large patches of bright regions as well, for instance, here, um, and at the same position here, um, and also another example is here. Um, so so it, it looks pretty consistent uh, with our uh, measurements, at least that um, um, we see uh, co uh, correlated regions uh, by eyes. Um, but then here is a little bit, of, little bit more mass. So I admit that now um, these equations are a little too many for a 15 minute talk, uh, but I will do this uh, very briefly. Um, so uh, the power spectra consists of three components, which are uh, one halo term, two halo term, and the shot noise term. And for one halo term, for instance, that's calculated by this. Um, so here, uh, uh, within the uh, flat sky approximation, or limbo approximation. So here, chi is the coma beam distance, and mh is the halo mass, and dnh over dmh is the halo mass function. And U gal K here uh, is the galaxy distribution within halos, um, uh, the Fourier transform of that. Uh, so we use the NFW profile for this. And then the only part left that we model is are these um, S bars, uh, which are uh, the average flux at given frequency um, for central galaxies and satellite galaxies uh, separately. 
And then um, another, you know, uh, so here's the same calculation, similar calculation for the twelve term and, and for the Sean Lewis term. Then, like I said, you know, the only part that we model is these as the bars, the flux. Um, and, and that is for central galaxies, for instance, that is directly related to uh, the, the star formation rate. So here, italic S, MS, that's the average star formation rate of the uh, main sequence galaxies. And K is the conversion between star formation rate and, and total infrared luminosity. And there are two apps, which are one is for uh, the conversion between total infrared luminosity and, and some millimeter flux um, at given frequency. And another FQ is the uh, point diffraction of galaxies as given stellar mass. Then we further, then we further model uh, this SMS, the star formation rate, uh, with a total of uh, four or five uh, model parameters, uh, which control relative dependence and mass dependence and um, the, the, the overall normalization. And then the calculation for the satellite galaxies is just the same, except that here uh, it's integrated over uh, the sub halo mass function. So, um, so here are the, some preliminary results for the model fitting. So here the red lines are showing the uh, model fit from the formalism and the uh, blacks are showing the um, observation measurements. Um, and the solid line shows the total uh, model fit and one halo, uh, the dot dashed line shows the one halo term and the dashed line shows the uh, two halo term and the dotted horizontal line shows the uh, shot noise term. And you can see that um, the one halo term, so even if um, the upcoming feature surveys um, extend to the larger scales or small scales, uh, the one halo term is not constrained very well. Um, since it's dominated by the sec uh, two halo term on large scales and uh, uh, dominated by the shot noise on, on small scales. But, but otherwise, you know, overall, the, the model fit is uh, uh, reasonably good. Um, can I ask, sorry, uh, like, uh, what's, like, what is the distinction here between the one halo term and the shot noise? Yeah, so, um, so one halo term is basically, you know, um, the, the cross, cross, you know, cross correlation between galaxies within the same halo, uh, while the, the shot noise is ba basically actually the, the, you know, each individual, I mean, all the correlation of, so it's sort of all the correlation of um, uh, each individual galaxy, you know, no matter where, no matter where they are, I mean, no matter whether, you know, so that's just, so that just totally depends on um, the number um, density um, instead of, uh, you know, any distribution within, within the same halo, so. Have you somehow like subtracted like the shot noise from the one halo term? Is that what you mean? Yes, yes, yeah, right, right, right. Hmm. Uh, uh, okay. <laughs> right, um, um, and then, um, yeah, so here I'm comparing uh, the prediction, the model prediction for the star formation rate uh, which are shown by the solid lines. And uh, the, the, the symbols are showing the uh, observation estimate, um, which is totally different, totally independent um, observation measurement from um, the, our cross-correlation measurements. So that is by um, Schreiber, that is from Schreiber at all 2015. And we didn't use that observation estimate uh, as a constraint for our model either. So given that, you know, it's pretty um, remarkable um, that uh, the match is great uh, between the solid lines, uh, between the model predictions and the observation estimate. Um, but, you know, um, at least, you know, part of um, some, some of the parameters that we fixed in our model, um, that came from, that is based on um, those um, symbols, uh, those observation estimates. So maybe that's the reason, um, but yeah. But, but still there are, so, you know, um, so we've been, you know, so far still focusing on um, uh, being sure completely sure about the measurements and the Milky Way contamination. So there are still um, quite some works um, to be done um, for, that, for the modeling part. So these are all um, preliminary results. Uh, yeah, so um, I will leave uh, summary here. I might, yeah, I will leave the summary here, um, but, but the bottom line is that uh, we detect, um, we think we detect um, strong cross-correlation signal um, after um, carefully taking care of um, the epitech. 
take uh, carefully take into account um, all these um, uncertainties and and um, systematics uh, potential systematics. Um, yeah, so so yeah, I will leave I will I will leave the summary page here and then thank you for your attention. Yep, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Shunha. And yeah, the floor is open for question. Peter, please. Hi. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, that's an excellent introduction, and I, I just have a couple of questions and comments. Uh, right. Well, the the thing you last showed us about your separation into shot uh, one and two halo. Right. Uh, my question would be. They kind of look a lot like what Marco Vieiro got uh, from Spire only, but cross-correlating two different uh, Spire maps. Right, right. Uh, so, so you've, uh, I guess, done this co uh, comparison. Are are they quite similar? Because they are. They're in some ways independent. Right, right. So yeah. So like you said, you know, you know, we do all the co uh, cross correlation and why they do all the correlation. But um, you know, regarding some you know fit um, characteristic like like um where uh the dominance between uh, shunt noise and the uh, one a uh, trail term um occur and you know um the overall shape or the dominance of the shunt noise term um on small scales on things like that and and, and the fact that the uh, one area term is not constrained very well um those those um are quite consistent with their uh their results and actually our you know many parts of our formalism um for the model fitting is um is actually um largely relying on the, the formalism by um um better man at all i i, I don't remember if Vielo at all also used the uh, Use the the model by Betterman at all, but um um, um it's basically um similar to the the uh, theoretical fitting by the Betterman at all um as well. Okay, it, I don't want to dominate the questions. We will have lots of time to talk, but I I applaud your uh, effort to get rid of the Milky Way signal, and in FLS, if you correlate uh, the FLS H one with the uh, so what we see in the thermal dust emission, it, it's not actually a good correlation because either the emissivity is changing or there's H2 dust or there's H2 gas, molecular hydrogen gas in the H1. I don't know the answer, but uh, I think I would throw out my hands and say, we know it's a galactic filament and just mask the damn thing. Uh, right, right. Uh, so uh, that's, that's, one, that's not so much a question as a comment. Uh, Another is that we've got uh, nice uh, arc minute resolution observations in H1 of the LSN1 field. So you and uh, Antoine Marshall should get together and, and look at that because at one arc mi minute resolution, you can uh, see what's going on. Not, not like Cephas, that's just got terribly good resolution, but at least you're getting closer to what Spire sees. And you might be able to. Uh, use that to learn something about how to get rid of the zeros. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So yeah, yeah. Anyway, we'll talk. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Cool. And we also have Ching. Uh, do you want to unmute yourself? Yeah, sure. Uh, wonderful work, Suhan. Uh, this is very relevant to what we're doing using the Dragonfly telescope. So I have two uh, short questions. Uh, one is when you gather the, the montage mosaic from the optical images, there must be a, a sky subtraction in the data processing. I mean, global, or local. So how do you assess like how much light might be uh, like reduced or, or, or like part of the signals would be removed like like during the analysis? Like, is there a uh, measure for that? And my second question is, what are the power index of the power spectrums? Right. Um. Yeah. So um. So maybe I. So yeah, so when when we construct this mosaic map, actually, so we don't do um any you know additional um funny process um that we apply um to this process um ourselves. So it's basically just um you know just use just cut the cut only we only cut the so there is a little bit of you know um overlapping area between um tiles. So we only cut those area um uh, since we found that so we we. We anyway throw that that overlapping area uh, from our cross correlation analysis since we found that sometimes you know there is um I mean signal to noise is different and sometimes uh, that 
that feature um, looks too bright of, to block our signal. So we just throw that away. But otherwise, we just we just um, just um, uh, put together the, the surface tiles to uh, construct the mosaic map. So maybe so. Is there any particular thing that um, you have in mind when you say um, you know um, data processing for making mosaic map um, that might affect the measurements? Oh yeah, I mean, I mean, I adjust the zero point to make the mosaic uh, like oh, yeah, at least yeah. yeah. Right. There must be a, like a sky subtraction at least on the like right, the right. Si size of the chip. Right, right. Yeah. So yeah. So we had a little bit of discussion on this. Um, um. So Ludo, for instance, uh, you know, um, said um, it is worth checking that. Um, but then um, mm -hmm. oh, sorry, the 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 Zhang Shao said uh, it's worth checking that when Ludo was, I didn't think um that would be. Um, significant factor, and then, then we could just uh, do the experiment, and it looks like you know um, the the pedestrial um, the the pedestal, sorry, the pedestal estimation and subtraction of the background uh, from tile to tile um, uh, from the 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 raw um, original data of the LSP processing is not um, is not very fluctuating too much between. I mean, so there, well, there is a little bit of actually um, instead of the, the the background modulation between um, already stacked tiles, but instead actually there is um, um, a little bit of ratio of a modulation of background between the original images. So it's from images if it's constructed tiles based on the images, and and particularly those images around the bright stars. Um, because they are bright and, and there is a dithering of CPs, the CFST, Megacam. Um, and so, so yeah, so Zhang Shao found, um, so have been feeling very uncomfortable with the, um, the current accuracy of the modulation or measuring the background from each image of the same region. Uh, but then he, you know, he tested, he did uh, multiple tests like, you know, uh, using um, 20 images rather than 10 or five images. And, and so, so I guess, um, and then he also tested um, a couple of different options for um, mosaicing to ensure about the background moderation. So I think um, I think it could be. So I think it's the issue that uh, that is um, still um, um, yet to be um, checked a little bit more carefully. But at least you know um, from all those test results that Zhang Shao did so far, um, it looks like um, at least this is the best that we could, that. This is the best we can do at this point with the CFS data. Um, um, hopefully, you know that changes in future with um, um, okay. other, you know, other surveys or other data processing. But, but, but so far, you know, to us, you know, um, with every, the results from, um, I mean, the the different map mosaicing from um, um, any of our attempt um, um, leads to a very similar um, cross correlation measurement. So. Um, we think that um, that's not, that's only a minor factor, even if it's a factor. Um, okay, thanks. Thanks, Xiaohua, uh, because uh, we are hitting uh, 4 p.m. Uh, oh, let's yeah, give sorry. a round of oh, applause yeah. to our speaker first, and we can continue our discussion yeah. afterwards. Yeah, yeah, but yes, yeah, yeah. let's all thank our speaker, Xiaohua, yeah. for his talk today. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. So, uh, I will stop the recording, and whoever uh, interested and have more questions, please stay on, and we can have a chat uh, with Xiaohua.